Hey everybody, Casey Miratori here. This is part three of the RefTerm live stream. In this part, I talk about how data from the circular buffer is processed as quickly as possible and then displayed on the screen by later stages of the pipeline. Uh, again, this whole thing is part of our Kickstarter promotion, so if you hadn't had a chance to check it out yet, please check out our Kickstarter. Uh, it's an awesome graphic novel series. We'd love to send you some books, so the link's in the description below. Please give it a shot when you get a chance. And if you're coming to this video cold, you may want to start by watching the first two videos in the series because I do refer to things in this video that I talked about in those videos. So it might be a little bit confusing if you haven't already seen them. The links are in the description below, so check those out as well. Without further ado, here's part three of the RefTerm live stream. So we know at the bottom of all of this, we have a buffer, and the buffer is all of the characters that came in. But we do have a problem. In the old days, it was easier because there was no such thing as like UTF-8 or UTF-16 or Unicode at all. So one byte meant one character, which was nice. Shortly after that, though, it became more difficult even for people before Unicode because into these terminal programs, people started injecting the idea that there could be control sequences and that those control sequences would do fairly complicated things. At first, with something like ASCII or the ANSI standard for character encoding, they were pretty simple things. They would be things like maybe like, you know, uh, clear or jump to the beginning of the line or feed forward to the next line, like backslash N and backslash R, if you know them in C, right? But eventually they added way fancier stuff. There ended up being huge terminal escape codes that are like eight characters long, 12 characters long, several characters, right? And these escape codes were designed to do things like allow you to move the cursor to a particular position, change the color, change whether it blinked or not, change whether it's underlined or not. So even before Unicode came on the scene, this buffer is actually going to start containing a lot of stuff that you can't just slap on the screen because it needs to be interpreted in some way. Now, this buffer, for our purposes, also should allow Unicode. So we want to do both things. We want to handle control sequences that came from the old days, and we want to handle Unicode that comes from the new days. And all of that just combines to mean that when we look at this buffer, what we have to do is figure out how the bytes in this buffer first break into lines and then break into glyphs because it is not straightforward either way, right? Because it's variably sized window that needs to reflow and all that stuff, we don't know that lines are going to be in any particular place. And because there's all the control codes and Unicode and all that stuff, we don't even know how many characters it's going to be for a particular line even once we know how long that line would be. Right? Because some Unicode characters, some, some single glyphs in Unicode might be several characters. We have control sequences in there that change the color, and those are multiple characters long, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have this buffer here, right, we need to build something on top of it as an acceleration structure. Now, to me, this was kind of an obvious thing to do, but you might ask, how did you know to do that? Really, there's two reasons I knew to do that. Number one is that a giant buffer like this, which could be many gigabytes large, like maybe I want my scroll back to be like 16 gigabytes of data or something, right? I just know because I've been programming a long time that I'm not going to search through 16 gigabytes of data on every frame to find out where the lines are, right? So I know that I need to handle this buffer incrementally, right? I need to be able to handle this buffer incrementally. Handling this buffer incrementally means that as new data comes in, I want to just look at it once when it comes in, and I don't want to ever look at it again unless I actively need to put it up on the screen, right? So that means I'm going to break this up into two passes. One that's about putting glyphs on the screen, and that happens every frame, and one that's about figuring out where the lines are in the buffer so that I don't have to look through the entire buffer to figure out which lines go on the screen. So this ends up getting broken into a line buffer. The line buffer, remember, I don't want to copy anything from here. So the last thing I want to do is allocate memory 
for each line in the line buffer and copy it out. Again, following principle number two, non-pessimization, never do work that doesn't need to be done. A lot of times I do see programmers who just like, oh, I want a buffer of lines. I create a string inside the line and I just like set the string equal to the part that was going to be in that, right? No, like that is making things slower. So what the line buffer does is it just has indices into this buffer, right? It just has indices into this buffer that say that the line goes from like here to here, right? So it's two indices. That way I don't move any data. I just set two bounds. So no matter how long that line is, I will never, you know, do, uh, I will never like copy any extra, any, any more data than just the two uh, integer values that have to go in there, right? Now this line buffer works exactly the same way as the underlying buffer, except since it's so much simpler and not variable size, it doesn't need to be double mapped in memory like the other one. It's just a flat array of indices, right? And I just write into it as a circle as well. I set how many maximum lines of scroll back do you want? That's the size of the buffer. And as I parse things, I just add new entries into the line buffer as I go, right? And newer entries overwrite older entries. Now, there's some subtlety here. One of the nice parts about if you generally program using non-pessimization as a guiding philosophy is that you learn a bunch of techniques that are very easy to apply that get you out of doing a lot of complicated work. One of the things that you might say is, well, how do you know that these buffers will wrap at the same time? What if the circular buffer for the data wraps at a different time than the line buffer for the lines, and one of these lines indices happens to reference something that's no longer in the buffer? You display old data, right? Who knows what would happen? Well, it just so happens that Intel, and this is why I always say, <laughs> We are, so, we are so fortunate to have the hardware we have. The hardware is so powerful. Remember, I don't have to do anything to this buffer to make it circular because Intel did it for me, right? The chip is doing that. So this is circular because Intel did it for me. This is circular and has the reference, uh, doesn't have the reference problem I talked about because Intel also did that for me. And the way they did that for me is they made the processor 64-bit. Instead of using 32-bit indices into this buffer, I just use 64-bit indices into this buffer. Why does that help? It helps because now the indices can literally be the absolute byte index of the input that was coming in, not wrapped. So if 1 billion gigabytes of data have come in over that pipe, right? Then I actually, or I should say, let's, let's, let's make it something understandable. If one terabyte of data has come in over that pipe, but the scroll back buffer for, for the actual data is only one gigabyte, I still use indices that are like one terabyte. And the next byte that comes in is one terabyte plus one. Then what I do is when I look up a line, I just remember the top index of the earliest byte in this buffer. So when stuff comes in, I add, right? And so then what I can do, well, it's, it's, it's a little bit misleading because, right, remember, this is circular buffer, so this is moving. But I remember the absolute index of what that is. That way, in the line buffer, I store what that, those absolute indices are. If the absolute indices for the line buffer occur prior to the current low watermark, right, the earliest byte back that I can still remember, then I know that line has scrolled out and I can't display it. So again, here, this whole system, very, very little code for this part. The line parsing we're going to talk about is where almost all the code exists, but very, very little code for this part because of Intel and AMD, right? Dr. Lisa Sue has your back. She did all this for you. You don't have to write it because the CPU just does it. It's got 64-bit anywhere you want it, so you're good to go. And it can remap the memory, so it's basically doing circular buffers for you. You got off easy, right? Okay. So given that you have a line buffer and a buffer, the renderer, right, is now one port out of this line buffer. So this is the rendering part. 
And then the parser, right, is the thing that actually has to do, I guess we'd look at it this way. The parser is the thing that has to feed things into the line buffer. Now the renderer includes a parser in it, and we'll talk about why. But in general, this is what we're doing. We've got a buffer. Every time new things come into the buffer, we run a parser on the new data and we feed that into the line buffer. The line buffer now knows where the lines are, so the renderer can just read out the lines that it's supposed to display, run them through a parser that does something else, and that outputs the grid. Right? It outputs the grid of character glyphs that should be there. The renderer is then a trivial shader that just renders that, that grid. Right? Now the cache is involved here too, and the cache We'll talk about when we talk about the parser. OK. So let's talk about the actual code that I actually wrote, because this was like nothing, right? This getting to here is like no code. I'll show you the code after, but it's almost no code. OK, so non-pessimization. Once again, how is this working? Well, non-pessimization means don't make the CPU do something the user might not want you to do, right? Anything that you do in your code that the user isn't going to want to see or deal with or experience is just a waste of time, right? It's just, you just wasted CPU time. So one of the reasons that these parsers are split is not just because I don't want to copy or generate copies of things. That's one reason. Because remember, if this parser was changing a lot of stuff around, I would have to allocate potentially space to store that or something, and this would create work that was being done here for no reason. So I really want this parser to be the simplest possible parser that all it does is chunk things up so that I know roughly what I need to look at when I render. So it's really just a pre-pass parser. And that's for the reason that imagine what happens if you dump a terabyte of data to this thing. The user's not going to watch a terabyte of data being dumped to the terminal. So what they want is for it to dump as fast as possible, and they only want you to spend time displaying the part they wanted to look at, which is maybe the tail of the terabyte as it's going, or a scroll back into some part of the terabyte they want to look at. But they definitely don't care if you drew every byte of the terabyte, you're just wasting the user's time. Now here's another place where the backwards compatibility excuse is, you know, flow like water. People are like, oh, but the requirement for POSIX or something is that you have to display the... It's like, I don't care, right? That's a terrible excuse. If you think that's important, put a checkbox in your terminal that says POSIX compliance that slows everything down to a crawl and displays everything to the user for enough time for them to see it. Great. Go nuts. Totally buy that. But if you don't have that checkbox, don't tell me that's the reason that your terminal's slow. Because you could have just provided the checkbox that doesn't wait for that, and now your terminal will be fast for the 99.999999999999 repeating, which also equals 100%, of the users who don't care about that, right? Never use a standard or compliance or, or backwards compatibility to excuse bad performance when you know that you're just taking some little case, right? And you're expanding that out into an excuse when you could have just had that, uh, that uh, case be an option. And then all the users who don't care about that option, which is all of them, just uncheck it, right? And now they've got a fast terminal. So <clears throat> we know that we want to, in here, only do the minimal amount of work we need to be able to look at this later. So that's why the parser is split into two parts. This part of the parser is the one that will actually do harder work. And we want to push as much work as we can onto this parser so that our throughput is as fast as possible because we know that in high throughput scenarios, we won't be rendering most of the things. We want to skip them to avoid having the user wait for work they don't benefit from. OK, so this parser is the one that I did some optimization on. So we'll talk about that at the end, but all it does is look for control sequences and new lines and stuff like that. Things that would like, like things that jump to a different line, things that break a line, right? That's what that parser does. This one was actually optimized. It was barely optimized. It was like a half hour of optimizing, but it was optimized. Everything else in the system is unoptimized. So the, the rest of the system is just a non-pessimized system. So what does the render and the parser do up here? 
What happens is when it pulls out lines from the line buffer that it needs to display, it needs to do a couple things. It needs to wrap those lines correctly. It needs to change colors and process control sequences inside those lines. And it needs to take things like Unicode that need to combine multiple characters into specific glyphs. And it needs to actually do that work of mapping them, right? So here's where this part of the process comes in. This parser is fairly straightforward. It takes a line, it looks at the line, it looks for control codes. If it sees control codes, the thing such as change the color to blah, then it changes the color to blah, right? If it says make this blinking, it changes it to blinking, and so on. And there's one thing that I did just to be squinky, um, because again, I just wanted to blunt a lot of the excuses that I knew that would happen. There is one thing that I do in this parser that is kind of unavoidable because of terminals, but that you want to do for compatibility, which is a lot of those things that I wouldn't really need to process, like the things that are like change the color, I process them in here anyway. And the reason is so that if you have a giant stream of one terabyte of data and you set the color to red as like the very first thing you do, and you dump a terabyte, I need to remember that as I'm going through. So in addition, to this line buffer having the indices that map where each line is, it also has basically like a pen. It remembers, was it blinking, was it red, right? It remembers a little chunk of data for each line. That's what the line started as. And that's what allows it to do things like make sure that it's going to display the correct results for holdover sequences. If you were designing a terminal thing today, you'd never do that. It's very inefficient. You don't want to do it. But be So what you'd have in the standard is that, for example, jumps or returns reset the pen state. That's what you do in the protocol to make sure that it runs more efficiently. But that's not the protocol we have, and we have to work with the protocol we have, so I worked with the protocol I have. Turns out it's not particularly slow because most of the time you're not processing those, so that's good, but it's worth noting that that is actually happening here as well. Okay, so what happens in here is we start and we go through the characters, and if all we see is ASCII characters, that's going to be the easy case. But if we see things like control codes, we parse those and do the control codes. And if we see things like Unicode, we're very sad. So when we see Unicode, we get a big old frowny face, and that's because we know we're going to have to talk to Uniscribe, right? Now, you'll notice that we do something very specific here. Um, and again, this is because I believe this is a better choice than the choice that other people make because of the fact that Uniscribe works the way it does. I never parse Unicode in this parser. Technically, if you wanted to make the terminal output be 100% correct to like a POSIX standard, well, I guess I don't know about POSIX standards, but I'm assuming that there are standards that require you to parse the Unicode first to figure out how long the lines are because the line wrapping that happens it might accumulate if you're not in a reflow mode. So like modern terminals that reflow lines, it kind of breaks the POSIX idea anyway because POSIX doesn't really acknowledge that. It's like lines get wrapped when they happen and that moves the cursor somewhere that matters. So the actual standard kind of conflicts with what a user would probably want. And it's one of the things that makes running a terminal very unsatisfying. I really didn't like that aspect of how the thing is specced. So I decided I'm not really going to do that, but you could do that. The reason I didn't want to do that is because I felt like if I did that, I would end up rewriting Uniscribe, which maybe was, would have been good, but it would have been another two weeks of me doing stuff, and this is not my job. I don't get paid for this, unfortunately. So anyway, um, what I wanted to do was defer Unicode parsing until after, because any sane user of a terminal actually wants that to happen anyway, because you'd rather have lines be elastic and pretend they were infinitely long, because that's how a user actually wants to experience 99% of the things that they do. And again, this would be the POSIX checkbox idea. If I ever did do that, if I was actually working on this terminal, I would still do exactly this. I would just have an option to run it during processing because you almost never want it. So you want to keep the performance things like that that would be slower. You want to keep those as options because for 99% case, you don't want it. And so you're just paying to slow something down that users are just going to get annoyed with, right? Okay. So when we look at how this entire system works, what we're doing in this parser now is we're going through and we're, we're doing the fine grain work of going, all right, for each individual uh, cell, what is the pen state? What's the color? All that stuff, which kind of accumulates as we interpret escape codes, right? So we know what it is. 
But eventually we're going to get something we can actually render. And that could be like a Unicode sequence, like a UTF-8 sequence, or it could just be like a single ASCII character, right? So UTF-8 uh, would just be like the high bit is, is not set, so it's just going to be that glyph. So every time we get to one of those glyphs, here's where the cache comes in. I know that if I talk to Uniscribe or DirectWrite or whatever, right, that's going to be very slow. So what I do is I, uh, well, there's, there's, there's actually, I moved that into here uh, at 1.2. Uh, so the way that it works now is a slightly different. There's actually a bit for it here, so it doesn't even have to pre-scan. But um, the way this works is twofold. One is on lines, when they flow through this parser, it was free for me to, while I was doing the line breaking, detect whether any Unicode existed on that line or not. So there's actually a bit set on the line buffer for each line that says whether or not it needs to go through Uniscribe. That allows me in the mine run of cases where people are not printing any Unicode characters, which is the vast majority of uses for terminal programs, because even people who are foreign language native oftentimes are running utilities that don't ha actually print out any Unicode, right? So the mine run of cases doesn't have to go through Uniscribe, so we just don't, right? So I have a path that does not go through Uniscribe at all, and then I have one that does. Both paths track the pen, but the Uniscribe path actually asks Uniscribe. And what it asks Uniscribe to do is very simple, but it asks it to chunk up the characters into the pieces that need to get turned into glyphs. Right? So how many characters do I need to feed into the system to generate glyphs? And that could be very a, a lot. Right? It, could be, it could be several. Okay, either way, when the parser parses the Uniscribe part or it just parses regular characters in the case of no Unicode, it still has to parse the control sequences, but just no uni Unicode, it's going to end up with a chunk. The chunk is one character for non-Unicode or multiple characters for Unicode that need to get turned into one or more glyphs. Now, why is it one or more glyphs? The reason it's one or more glyphs is because unlike Windows Terminal or other terminal programs I've seen, I wanted to support correct ligatures, like the whole thing. So if there was a giant multi-cell thing, like like uh, in Farsi, there are some characters that go, well, they'd go the other way in Farsi. They'd be going right to left. But what you look at when you, uh, when you see those, those glyphs, they could be very long. So it could be multiple character cells that all kind of like flow together. Um, and I wanted to make sure that was handled correctly and took up the correct amount of space. So in order to do that, I knew that I would need to say that not only do multiple chunks, like multiple uh, characters have to get fed into the glyph generation, but multiple characters have to come out of the glyph generation, right? So that's where the cache comes in. And to be fair, the cache is arguably not simple. It's the one part of this thing that is not simple. The reason it's not simple is because it, it requires, I would say, it requires you to kind of have understood hashing and how hashing works, um, which a lot of people don't. Certainly I didn't until I did a bunch of work with hashes, and then I kind of felt like I learned a lot. Um, and it requires you to be able to write an LRU cache, which does take a little bit of work. So the cache is probably the only piece of code that's actually somewhat complicated. It's not that hard. I wrote it in a day or two. Um, so, you know, I think you can watch me write it on stream in eight hours. I think that stream was just, there was just a stream where I wrote it. But, eh, it, it is... I wouldn't say that it's simple. It is, so everything else here was was really trivial. And that, eh. I mean, it took eight hours, right? Eight hours is a lot of programming. So it's not nothing. It's not nothing. So how does the cache work? That's it for part three. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back here tomorrow for part four, where I'll go over how the cache works for the glyph generation system. Again, this whole thing's part of our Kickstarter promotion, so please check out the Kickstarter if you get a chance. The link's in the description below. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow with part four, so I hope to see you back here for that.